Divine Truth Feedback Discussions Jesus, Mary, and others give personal or group feedback to people who have asked for personal assistance. This is Session 1, Part 6 of the discussion Forgiveness and Dealing with Those Who Harm Me, where Jesus and Mary give some personal feedback to Sandra Tsai about her questions relating to God's principles and laws of forgiveness and repentance and address many common false beliefs regarding forgiveness, repentance, love, obligation, harm, and abuse. This session was recorded on the 19th of June, 2018, from 11 a.m. in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. How will abusive people ever be corrected if I forgive them? Yes, I suppose this is an extension of our previous question, or previous couple of questions, isn't it? And the reality is, abusive people or people who harm us personally, assuming the harm is in defined as harm by God's laws, Mm -hmm. in other words, it's defined as a sin Mm -hmm. from God's laws perspective, they're never let off the hook ever. Mm. You know, the law demands a penalty, just Mm -hmm. like any law. And there's always a penalty. It's not like laws that are enforced by humans, Mm. uh, where you require a judge and a policeman and all those kind of things. With God's laws, there's an immediate effect upon the soul, mathematical effect upon the soul that affects the emotional condition of the soul mm. from breaking a law. So, so as soon as you break the law, there's the condition, bang. It yeah. happens immediately. It's immediately there inside of the person's soul. So every time a person that chooses to abuse or chooses to harm somebody else, chooses to break God's laws, mm-hmm. right? Every time the choice is made, there is immediate, penalty upon the soul emotionally that is impacting upon the soul from that moment on. And, and if they do more harm, more harm, more impact and so forth upon the soul. Mm-hmm. Ever increasing darkening of their condition of happiness. In other words, instead of being happy, which we would call a condition of light, mm-hmm. they become more and more personally unhappy. Yeah. Every act that is taken that is a sin as a result of the penalty of the law. Mm-hmm. So, so they are not getting away with anything. Yeah. Now, you may choose to forgive them. You're, you can't let them off the hook for the penalties associated with the law. Mm. There's only things that they can do to do that. And they have to go through the repentance process to do that. If they refuse to go through the repentance process, then the law of compensation process will drag them through an entire process, removing all of the effects of their disastrous life, breaking the law constantly. Right. Yeah. But but with you, your action of forgiving has has really no effect on their correction Mm. and it cannot really have any effect on their correction. Now, it has some what I would classify as third party potential effects, Mm -hmm. but only if they're sensitive to them. Yeah. And when I say third party potential effects, I'm talking about the effect of you being kind to them, no matter what they do, often does have some kind of impact upon them. Yes. Right. Because, you know, they they know they're being angry, but every time you're kind after a while, they 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 start feeling bad about how angry they are and you're always kind Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know so yeah we talked about this in previously today didn't we in the section about um how my forgiveness affects someone who's harmed me that's right yeah yeah so so the reality is there's some sort of sort of third party effects but that's only a potential it depends upon their sensitivity to that Mm -hmm. and their own responses to your love Mm -hmm. as to whether and their reception of your love as to whether they will respond to those particular things As regards the law, the law corrects them. Mm -hmm. So they're going to be corrected one way or another, just not by you. And and in fact, the arrogance of believing that you're able to correct Mm -hmm. another person is in itself a sin. Yes. Because we are personally not able to correct people. Mm -hmm. They are only corrected through their own desire. Yes. That's the only thing that can really correct them and the operations of God's laws, including the laws of compensation and forgiveness and repentance are what corrects them. So, so for us to believe that my rage with them corrects them is an arrogant position in the first place because it doesn't correct them. Yeah. It, does, it cannot correct them. Sp- stating the truth to them may help in their correction, but it still doesn't correct them. Yeah. 
their correction is going to have to be an emotional process mm -hmm. that they'll either choose to engage through the laws of repentance and forgiveness, or they'll choose to resist and therefore be, have the law of compensation imposing its operations upon them. Mm. That's the only way they're going to be corrected anyway. And that's the only way you're corrected. Let's face it. It's the only way any of us are corrected. <laughs> no, it doesn't matter what other people say to us. At the end of the day, you can talk to your blue in the face to somebody and not correct them. <laughs> um, when we consider this question, I, I also think of a few other things. Uh, really, the, the concept that um, forgiveness is opposite to correction is a problem, isn't it? The, the, the question, how will people ever be corrected if I forgive them, it tends to indicate that, that, that forgiveness means permissiveness, and we've discussed that before in this discussion. But also, um, it sort of kind of implies that correction comes from all of the states that I would be in before forgiveness, so anger, mm. desire to make someone and it's guilty. it's completely the opposite. Yeah, eh? it is the opposite. And so I think about this in terms of society or the world. Like for humans, we we often have the false belief as societies that if we forgive someone, then they'll never be corrected. When actually, if we engage with forgiveness from God's definition of forgiveness. Mm -hmm then we're actually going to be the most equipped to correct every person who... Well, we can't correct them, but we can assist their correction. Sorry, support the correction. We can support, support their correction. Our systems, our, yeah. our correctional systems we'll would become correction. correctional. That's right. They, That's they right. Would, sorry, they would support correction. That's right, yeah. instead of just punishment, which is the main reason for them now. Or, or I don't know, you know, just housing away from society <laughs> exactly or, you yeah. know protection or, you know yeah. fear and protection yeah. and punishment is yeah. the main reasons why we have prisons yeah. at the moment it's not yeah. it's not for correction yeah now if you if you look at it from a from a logical perspective you can see the truth of this if if i engage in a violent behavior towards you i already have i've obviously within me justifications for that violent behavior if you engage in violent behavior as a result of that of my behavior towards me so in other words, you quid pro quo, you know, mm -hmm. eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, mm -hmm. life for a life with me, mm -hmm. then, then all you've done is actually, to me, is you've actually shown me that my belief of the world is true. Mm. That's all you've done. You've, yeah. you've, supported, you've supported the concept that my violence is justified in the first place yeah. because you believe your violence is justified as a response. Yeah. So you've supported my belief, mm -hmm. right? That has actually had the effect on me of reinforcing my belief. Yeah. So what's my likely response to your violence? More intense violence is yes. my, going to be my response. Yeah, obviously, right? yeah. Because, because, that, because you've supported my belief that violence is the response. If you responded differently and violence was not your response, you now no longer support my belief that violence is the proper response. Mm. That's a more highly likely place to correct me yeah. than the other, where you've become violent. Yes. Because when you become violent, you're now supporting my false belief. Yeah. You're not correcting me. Yes. You're actually supporting my belief. Yeah. Right? So, so every time a person, every time we refuse to forgive, mm -hmm. we are actually supporting the violent beliefs of the persons who perpetrated harm. Yeah. Absolutely. And the, you're describing a dynamic where there's a lack of love, there's anger, there's violence that's being reciprocated all of the time. And even when I have sinned, the repentance process involves me opening up not to more violence, but to being loved. Mm. I have to acknowledge my sin, feel all of the ramifications of my sin and all, all like it's a massive kind of uh, process of me taking responsibility, but equally, it's about opening up to to a loving environment, mm. and and that's what I often think about in terms of what God has designed for us. If if a society was to um, was to attempt to emulate that that process. I think that a lot of people feel like it's only when some someone's either vindictive and 
got a big problem and going to go and fix the problem of the people or the, the issue within society or they just don't care at all. Like the only way to, to give a shit is to, to be kind of cranky about the issue. Mm -hmm. When, as you know, when you engage with a forgiveness process, as you spoke about earlier in our discussion, you are passionate about the issue. Mm -hmm. It's not a less caring. You're more passionate about the mm -hmm. issue. You're more vocal about the issue. You take more definition, definite um, action. action to correct or t to not support the issue. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I just think violent. that's... But you're not violent. Yeah. yeah, you're not vindictive. You're not driven by all of these not other... Not driven by hatred, resentment, yeah. past hurts, any yeah. of those things. Yeah, mm. yeah. Interesting. I, I just think it's because this question dealt with correction, I think yeah. it's, it's, it's a very interesting, um, we can look at it on a micro scale of each of us as individuals operating mm -hmm. with God's laws. And you can see it in society too, can't you? Yeah. Like, so this whole idea of correction is, you know, will they ever be corrected if I forgive? Will they have a higher likelihood of being yeah. corrected <laughs> if I forgive than they yeah. do if I don't? Yeah. So that's the real answer to the yeah. question they have a higher likelihood of correction if I forgive. Yeah. If everyone in the world doesn't forgive the other, then we've all got a lower likelihood of correction. Mm -hmm. You know, that's mm -hmm. how it's going to be. So this is why God forgives. Yeah. The reason why God forgives is because we have a higher likelihood of self-correction if God forgives. Then if mm -hmm. God was a punishing God, like the Bible claims, you know, the Christian Bible claims, or like the Muslim Quran claims, if God was a punishing God like they, those holy books claim, then, then of course we would have less opportunity for correction, mm. right? So, so uh, you know, you can see how these holy books actually blaspheme the mm. the nature of God. Mm. What an incredible gift mm. that God uh, wants our our correction so much that that, that forgiveness. Yeah. 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 Does my forgiveness benefit those who haven't harmed me? Yes. Well, uh, of of course it does benefit yeah. those who haven't harmed me. Uh, I suppose, uh, though, most people would be confused about how that's the case. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're forgiving a person who has harmed you, and how does that benefit the people who haven't harmed you? Yeah. you know? yeah. so, so we probably need to go through yeah. some of the ways in which that happens. Yeah, mm. all right. So why don't I read the points and you can respond. Okay. Obviously, we want to point out that there's just so many benefits. The forgiveness, because it's one of God's highest laws, uh, it it engages uh, like thousands of benefits, thousands of benefits, you know, almost an infinite number of benefits. Yep. You, you could say it's how it would be very difficult to measure the benefits of one single act of forgiveness yeah. because they're compounding and exponential. Yeah. And also uh, we'll we'll talk about well, some they have of compounding this. effects for for from that point of time onwards as well. For, so it's into very, the future yeah. forever. Yeah. So it's it's incredible. Uh, forgiveness really is, forgiveness and repentance because they're dealing with those higher laws, they just give so much to the universe when even one of us decides to engage at home. That's right, yeah. yeah. So there's far too many to mention, of course, yes. we're going to be here for years <laughs> yeah. talking about it, but, but there are some primary ones that people might not have considered that yes. we might be able to mention. Yes. Mm. All right, so firstly, I'm going to be more able to accurately assess people's intentions in general, not just the person who's harmed me. Exactly, because yeah. I'm now aware of the sin mm -hmm. and I've also released from myself the emotions relating to the, my response to the sin. Mm -hmm. This means that because I've released my emotions that were damaging me and others already, yeah. now I'm going to be sinning less. Yeah. Because I'm now sinning less, naturally it's going to have a more positive result on everyone around me, not just the person who sinned against me. Yeah. Right. Because I've chosen to forgive, I'm sinning less. Yeah. And and as a result, they, everyone around me is going to bear the benefit, the consequence of me sinning less, yes. which obviously are going to have more powerful effect on their lives in terms of make their life happier. Yeah. But but it's also the fact that I, I won't start. See, the trouble with not forgiving is that we have inside of us a whole group of emotions that basically say that everyone is like the person who harmed us. Yes. You know, and the harm might have been done in the past, so in our childhood usually, but might have been done, you know, in different parts of our adult life as well. But whatever that harm is that has been done, we now attribute to every person that's similar to that person who harmed us. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like if a, if, if a woman has severely harmed us in the past, we'll attribute that harm to every woman on the planet. Yeah. 
Now, what, what forgiving lets us do is it lets us see everybody accurately. Yeah. So now I can see, oh, that woman has the same problem as the woman who harmed me, mm -hmm. but that woman doesn't. Mm -hmm. So now I can be very much more selective, even in my acquaintances and my friendships and everything, because I know that that woman who has the similar thing to the person who harmed me, she's probably someone who's not a good to spend much time with. Mm -hmm. But that woman over there who hasn't got the same emotional thing that harmed me, she would probably be a good mm -hmm. person to spend some time with. And you'd have some trust and confidence that, you know, that person is not mm -hmm. going to harm you as well. Mm -hmm. So that benefits me. How does it benefit other people? Well, it means we're not, we're not putting on them things that are not a part of their nature. Yeah. So in other words, we're not assuming everybody's going to sin yeah. the same way as people in our past sinned against us. We're not us. prejudicial. We're no. not prejudicial. Yeah. So, so when you, when you, what I notice in most people's lives is they are prejudiced based mm -hmm. upon where they haven't forgiven. Yeah. And, and so they are imputing the mm -hmm. wrong motive yeah. to the persons, to every other person, because the person who sinned against them has those motives. And that, and that feels very uncomfortable and unpleasant on the receiving end, doesn't it? Of course it? it does. If you are always in a relationship where the other person's always presuming mm -hmm. that you are going to do the wrong thing, you know, yeah. they always doubt you or they yeah. always assume you're going to be dishonest at some point, it gets very, very tiring to spend time with mm -hmm. that particular person. Mm -hmm. so, so naturally, if uh, we don't have that coming out of us, then the people around us would be much happier to spend time with us. <laughs> it also enables us to engage intimately with our soulmate, doesn't it? And more um, lovingly with the people around us because we now have this more accurate assessment. Yes. And that, that is very beneficial for our soulmate and for other people around us, isn't it? That's yeah. right. Our emotions cause us to see everything in a different colour than what it really is. Mm. And, and so, you know, if I've got an emotion of rage, I see everything redder than it really is, you yeah. can say, you yeah, know. Yeah. I see everything with, with more inflammatory than it really is. Yeah. And, and so once you've released or forgiven and that rage no longer exists within you, now you're seeing things in the true colours that are there and you're not responding emotionally to what you're, you know, to what's not actually there. Yeah. And, yeah. and so that's naturally going to be of advantage to everyone who you interact with. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I'm also going to make wiser and more loving decisions. Yes, yeah, so every choice and decision we make has effects mm -hmm. and, and other people and the environment are affected by our choices and decisions. Yeah. Now that I'm making wiser decisions, because I'm not driven by this, you know, inflammatory emotions that are existing inside of me, they are all gotten rid of. Mm -hmm. I'm making wiser decisions and because I'm making wiser decisions, everyone around me is more highly likely going to benefit from my decisions. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, I'm also going to take more loving action and uphold truth, so God's truth here. Yes, yeah, so a lot of the times when I'm in a state of not forgiving, I am very resistive to being loving to people, mm -hmm. you know, and, and when I say very resistive, quite often I'll go, you know, notice somebody who has trouble and I go, no, I'm not going to help them, you know, they've just got this problem or they've got that problem. And instead of recognising the trouble that you could assist uh, them out of, you, you, you know, you, oh, I'm going to let them stay there. You know, everybody's got to learn, you know, to yeah. tough it out, just like I've had to. And, you know, yeah, here's the yeah, kind yeah. of attitudes you have. And, and when you have those kind of attitudes, you, you frequently make choices that are not harmonious with love mm -hmm. or truth. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, obviously, it has a detrimental effect on other people's lives in mm -hmm. the sense that they could have been rescued from their, their plight uh, or helped, you know, in mm -hmm. their life but you've chosen not to, you've yeah. chosen to avoid it. Whereas when we take, when we forgive, we take more loving action. So now we choose to engage in situations that would otherwise, we would otherwise avoid it. Yeah. And, and in, in the engagement, we have a positive effect on those people yeah. involved. And so, so, you know, you notice this a lot when once you've forgiven a lot of, uh, a lot, you can walk into a room and the whole tone of the room gets lifted by your, the light or the happiness that's in you, right? Because you've forgiven. But if you uh, were in a dark place, you walk into a room, uh, if other people are easily influenced by that darkness, you can see that can really pull down uh, yeah. uh, uh, you know, other people. So yeah. you can see that forgiving here causes you to act more lovingly, which naturally is going to have a result yes. on everyone around, around you. Around you, mm. yeah. You support love and truth in your environment.
yeah. just by nature of how you are. Not only support it, encourage it yes. too. You, yeah. you not only support it, but you're yeah. encouraging of it. And yeah. so people would not, who would not normally be loving might act more lovingly in your company. Mm. Yeah. Mm. 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 Okay, I also now demonstrate an example of humility and increased faith. Yeah, so what effect does this have on others? Mm -hmm. well, well, you know, if you're humble to your own emotions, it's more highly likely that people around you will be more sensitive to their own emotions. Yes. And if you have faith in God and God's goodness, it's more highly likely that people will start asking, why, why do you have faith in God's goodness? And mm -hmm. what, 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 what's going on there logically, you see? Yeah. And this causes people, remember we've said, how humility and faith in God's goodness are, are two of the biggest problems when it comes to repentance and forgiveness. Yes. So if you have those two qualities and, and show them and demonstrate them in your life, people around you start questioning those qualities in them. Mm -hmm. And this can have a great positive effect on their life. Yeah, it's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Um, also, my children and other people around me are not going to be subjective subjected rather to my negative influence of all my unhealed emotions and false beliefs that were there before I forgive, forgave. But instead, they're going to be influenced by some of these positive things you're mentioning. So uh, uh, mum or dad is really humble and they're, they're not afraid yeah. of feeling and that they, they have faith in this God character. And, yeah. yeah. But parents have very little uh, concept, I feel, about how their negative emotions are impacting on every single action of their children yeah. and every single feeling that their child has. Yes. And, and it's interesting when you see a parent growing in a family, the effect it has on the children. Mm -hmm. We often remark, you and I, about that, you know, yeah. how when a, we notice a person who's sincerely growing and the change in their children is remarkable. Yeah. Like, and so people are not really getting to a lot of times enjoy their children very much yeah. and the main reason why is because they're not understanding that their own emotions are having such an of a negative effect on their children yes. that their children are not even able to be themselves they're just yeah. acting in response to the parental unhealed emotional condition yeah. and and when the parents start healing their emotions you see a great improvement particularly in young children you know yeah. any child under the age of 10 to 12 mm -hmm. 12 you, you see some great improvements in the way and they interact with people and the way they engage and, and express. the expression of their personality yeah. and their nature and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you and I, we often talk about the the negative impact of unhealed emotion upon our children, but um, we maybe we don't talk enough about the incredible positive potential when a parent decides to engage God's way. What an immense gift that is for the kids. And yeah. you, you know, whenever I see a parent engaging that, I find it incredibly moving yeah. because what, an, what a, an amazing gift. And these parents that we're talking about are not necessarily asking their children to share their beliefs. In fact, that's something that they're really not doing. They're, they're trying not, to not do that. They're because not they're, forcing that on their that's kids. That's right, because they know that's against the law, yeah. right? But we do get to see these just beautiful changes. And yeah. I always think, yeah, you know, gold stars for those parents yeah. from God's perspective. Yeah, yeah no. yeah. Well, that's part of the reward is that their own children are easier to handle easier to mm -hmm. manage they're more loving with other people they're more loving with the parents themselves yep. and so forth so yep. naturally there are lots of positive benefits for that right yeah, yeah but but you know not many parents see that because they're not actually dealing with their emotional condition yeah. or their level of faith and they're not actually going through forgiveness yeah and as a result of that you know not many parents actually experience the benefits of that mm -hmm. yet mm -hmm. but but those who do you 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 know they'll become convinced yeah. that, that the, the forgiving is the way forward even for their whole family. Yes, mm. yeah, yeah. So that's just a few of the benefits to those who haven't harmed me, yeah. that my forgiveness of people who have harmed me yes. or who have sinned, yeah. uh, help, help, you know, that we can help other people in so many ways yeah. Yeah, yeah. With, with regard to forgiveness. Mm. Mm -hmm. How does my choice to forgive make the world a better place? Well, we've already seen through this particular discussion that we've been having that the, uh, you know, there's a lot of good outcomes from the process of forgiveness, right? Yeah. And also a lot of good outcomes from the process of repentance. But here we're talking about specifically the choice to forgive. But you can see that if, if one person makes the choice to forgive, mm -hmm. it starts influencing the people around them. Yeah. 
Now, if you multiply that by numbers of people, mm -hmm. by masses of people, then naturally mm -hmm. you can see it's going to have an effect on the world. Yeah. So just from a logical perspective, you can see the more people who personally engage in the process of repentance mm -hmm. and forgiveness, the larger there is uh, the, uh, the opportunity for the world to benefit for, yes. from them engaging in that process. Yes. Right? So we probably should, again, look at some general ways the world can benefit. Mm -hmm. but, but we can see that it's a natural, logical consequence of groups of individuals yeah. making that change. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. So um, we can say that on a global scale then, if I choose to forgive, just even one of me chooses mm. to forgive, I'm... Is there more than one of you? <laughs> I mean, as opposed to a number of us, yeah. one, of, one, one of, us. of me, one of us, there probably is more than one of me, which is... Well, no, there's only one soul, isn't there? Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so one person choosing to forgive can have a global impact, as we mentioned, um, and what it does, it encourages other people and even societies to engage with forgiveness. Yeah, if you if you see a person around you forgiving and just noticing the benefits of forgiveness in their personal life, then naturally there's a stronger desire for you to go, what's up here? Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. perhaps I need to have a look at this and yes. see what's going on to, going to happen for my life. Yeah, and and because as we've mentioned, when you forgive, you become even more passionate about the sin in question. What you do see in the world is that people who have engaged at least partly or sometimes completely in a process of forgiveness become like quite public examples of that. Yes. Because um, one, it's fairly unusual, but two, that person is very passionate now about the benefits of what they've done. And so one person can actually affect like a large number of Hundreds people. Hundreds, and with the communication yeah. today, yeah. millions of people can yes. be affected by one person. So. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. It also, well, I guess this is all an extension, isn't it now? Yeah. We lessen the likelihood of war, greed and economic problems through yes. our act yes. of forgiveness. So a lack of forgiveness causes us to act in anger. Yeah. When we act in anger, we make a lot of choices that are angry. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those choices are selfish. They harm other people. They even harm ourselves. Yeah. They usually harm the environment. So naturally, when we no longer act in anger, mm. it's, it's, you know, it's very hard to do some things that require anger in order to act. Now, so a lot of training, for example, of soldiers uh, causes them to be get angry, you know, yeah, yeah. so they're angry enough to go uh, uh, go to war. Yeah. You know, if a person's not angry, it's pretty hard to convince them to go to war. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, uh, you know, these are these are things that can happen automatically mm -hmm. if we forgive mm -hmm. you know naturally there's going to be an effect on people's nature and character mm -hmm. uh, in the sense of their you know in the sense of the, their character and nature will impact now upon their decisions rather their, than their unhealed emotions impacting upon their decisions yeah. and yeah. so that's going to obviously have a positive effect on the rest of the world yeah mm. yeah uh, you've already mentioned this a little, but it encourages others to seek God's truth and a relationship with God. Yes, uh, just by the act of forgiving, we become more open to the operation of our conscience. Mm -hmm. A person who's more open to the operation of the conscience is more open to the flow of God's truth into themselves. Mm -hmm. As such, they are also now more able to share it with others and then, uh, and then influence others to also become open to the operation of the conscience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so... What this then means is that naturally God's truth, God is directly able mm -hmm. to share God's truth to all of those people. So instead of there now being only a few people or even like in the first century, one person yeah. who, who is sharing God's truth on earth in, a, in an accurate way, you get thousands, potentially millions of people now mm -hmm. individually connected to God, therefore able to individually share God's truth in their area of influence. And that, of course, is going to have a very powerful effect on yeah. the planet. So, so you can see, you know, having an openness to those things through the act of forgiveness is, is going to be a good thing, not only for yourself, but also for the world. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, uh, it lessens abusers or people who want to take power or do harm. 
it lessens their ability to take that power over individuals and over societies. Yeah, this is a very, I think, important global uh, uh, thing to, to understand. Most people go, uh, you know, during, during conversation, most people ask us the question, why does God allow abusers to take control of the earth? Mm. And God doesn't. Mm. None of God's laws actually support abusers taking control of the earth. Yeah. You do, yeah. individuals do, <laughs> and collectively we do yeah. because of our unhealed emotions that we, have not, we haven't forgiven. Because we haven't forgiven. Yeah. yeah. So, so because we haven't forgiven, we have a tendency to, to pander to people who are abusive mm -hmm. and pander to and, and not recognise their sin mm -hmm. and rather support their sin. Yeah. Uh, because of that, we support people gaining power who actually are harmful mm -hmm. and therefore they make harmful choices and decisions in support of their harmful condition. And, and all of that would not happen if we individually made a different choice. Mm -hmm. so, so we can see if individually we all decided to restrict people who are abusive and restrict their power, just as God's laws do, you can see that people who take that kind of power would probably all be in prison of some kind it would be a correctional facility <laughs> yeah. of some kind. And, and we would not be governed by people who are evil, who have maintained power. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you can see that, you know, it would have a, quite a positive effect in the power structures of the earth as well. Yes. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And probably then fittingly, as our last point, we had listed, um, my soul is now in support of governance systems that are loving and just. And, and there we can say God's governance systems, but also any governance system that might exist on earth that is based on love and true justice. Yes, yeah, so I'll no longer vote for a government that I feel is not going to uphold the principles of the law, mm -hmm. God's law. Mm -hmm. I'll no longer, I'll, I'll instead only vote for a governing, governing system that does. Yeah. And so, you know, this... this uh, these are, these are ways that I will now support the change on mm -hmm. the planet rather than just supporting the status quo. Yes. See, mo most of us, make, we make decisions on a day-to-day -day basis that are the best of the worst decisions mm. because we don't think there's any better decisions that can mm -hmm. be made. So we sort of limited our, uh, our, our option scope. pool yeah. down to a certain scope, That's which right. is not in reality the only options that we have. That's right. Yeah. And so what we do is we go, right, in Australia here, for example, it's basically a two-party preferred voting system. Yes. And in many countries that is the case. That's not true democracy, yeah. but, but it's a form of democracy. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, it's not as good as other, uh, potentially other forms of democracy that could be created, but we're not open to creating them yes. because we like adversarial systems because we haven't forgiven. Yes. Right? We, we yeah. love an adversarial system because we're inside of us, there is a bit of anger and a bit of rage. And when we disagree with someone, we like to mm -hmm. voice that anger and disagreement. We don't like to come to a consensus or an agreement with them. And so we like an adversarial voting system yeah. as well. Yeah. <laughs> so a lot of demo, demo, so-called democratic voting systems are adversarial mm. and where they, you know, there's two parties or parties that are against each other all the time, rather than there being a cooperation towards a common goal yeah. that, that everybody agrees is the best possible outcome. And, and we see this occurring all the time. And this is why we also hold on to ideologies mm. that are obviously flawed in different ways and by by holding on to these ideologies we then can set up adversarial systems with the people who don't hold on to them yeah. and we do the same in religion the same in politics the same in you know all sorts of professions mm -hmm. the whole legal profession is governed by this mm -hmm. right and it's all because of the anger mm -hmm. <laughs> so so you forgive you don't feel like doing these things yeah. and if, the reality also is that if you forgive there are certain professions that you find very, very hard to stay in. One of them would be the legal profession yeah. in an in a, in a adversarial way, you yeah. know, so the, the way where you're adversarial, it would be very hard to stay mm -hmm. in the profession. And, you know, where you have the, comment, the goal that if both of us feel like we've got hard done by, then that's the best outcome. Yeah. <laughs> You know, that kind of adversarial system. <laughs> that's a good system. negotiation. Yeah, that's if, a, if everyone feels like they've lost something, then... If oh. everyone feels they've lost something, then it was probably a good negotiation. Yeah. Well, <laughs> wow, well, you know, this yeah. is not a loving way of seeing things, but, but it is based upon our, our desire to not forgive, you see. Mm -hmm. That's how we see things. Mm -hmm. And so we don't understand at this stage that humanity does not understand how much their desire to not forgive yeah. creates 
adversarial and and destructive systems yeah. that actually now are governing the entire planet. Yes. And and if we understood that, we would start engaging this personal process <laughs> of forgiveness instead. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and and in this section here of our discussion, we've been to, I've been trying to throw at you a lot of questions that seem to um be implied in Sandra's email mm. and so hopefully by now we're starting to see that gee there there isn't you know a choice of two hellish outcomes there's actually one outcome that one decision that is going to make things way way better on so many levels yes and, and you can see a lot of Sandra's questions were uh, focused on this adversarial type of com mentality yeah. uh, based upon the fact that she hasn't forgiven yes and she wants to set us up herself up as an adversary to the persons who harmed her yes and and this is uh, obviously not going to be conducive to healing mm -hmm. the problem but but it is what the average person believes about forgiveness and repentance, you know, and this is why the majority of people don't engage it because they have these underlying emotions that are adversarial mm -hmm. that cause them to not wish to engage the process yeah. personally. Personally. Know. They basically feel like I'm not going to forgive until you repent. Yeah. Right. That's the basic way that most people think. Mm -hmm. And when I say you repent, you have to repent the way I think you should yeah. repent, <laughs> not the way God thinks. Yeah. And, you know, you have to repent for the things I think you did wrong, not what God thinks you did wrong, because there might, there might be some things I think you did wrong that God thinks you did right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, you know, we have this very selfish adversarial way mm -hmm. of examining the issues of forgiveness and repentance. And because of that, we we are not examining all the negative things that happen as a result of our lack of forgiveness mm -hmm. and all the positive things that could be happening if we did forgive yeah yeah mm. <laughs> very good am i required to love my enemies <laughs> so so this is something sandra mentioned in her um letter she says not forgiving lets your enemies win but forgiving means that you now have obligations to love your enemies and to do for them and you've, you've addressed a lot of error within that statement in itself. That's right. The whole concept of obligation to love your enemies. Yeah. And even there's this question, am I required to love my enemies? Yes. Um, these particular statements indicate that there's the injury of, I'm going to get forced into loving somebody <laughs> when that's an impossibility. You, yeah. you love someone from desire or you don't. Or <laughs> God, God's demanding of me that I have to love other people. And, and God knows that he can't demand that yeah. you love people because, he, because uh, love is not something that can be demanded. Yeah, <laughs> he's highly encouraging, we could say, of course, all <laughs> through of the his, operation of law. Of course, yeah. all of these laws are, you know, focused on trying to help you become more loving. But it's still a choice you have to make yeah. to be more loving, but it's not an intellectual choice you can make. It's got to come from you emotionally. It's yeah. not, it's a feeling that you're going to have to have. It's not something you go, oh, I've decided I'm going to become more loving today. Yeah. So that's what I'm going to do. And then off you go and do it. It's not yeah. like that. Yeah. It, it's impossible to do that. You, mm -hmm. you have to, it has to come from your emotions. Yeah. It has to come from how you feel about things. Yeah. yeah. All right. So did you instruct people in the first century to love love your enemies it well, of course mentioned a number of times he <laughs> says of course why would we know it's of course well because you know you, isn't love such a thing that you would want to love everybody including yeah. anybody who sets themselves up as your enemy yeah right so yeah so it, just to give some quotes from the bible and, the, and and these are pretty close to what i said so so matthew 5 44 says but i tell you love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you mm -hmm. and i because I started off the statement saying, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbour and hate your enemy. Yeah. Which is actually the average person's idea. Well, it would be even better to say the average person believes love your friend and hate your enemy. Yeah. <laughs> but even with your friends at times, you, you have yeah. sort of a love-hate relationship yeah. with yeah. them, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Instead of a truly loving relationship, right? Yeah. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now, uh, what I notice is a lot of Christians now like, have all these pray prayers for those who persecute them, but it's all very selfishly oriented. And it's also about judgment of the person's sin. It's, mm -hmm. not, it's not a true prayer for the person's happiness mm -hmm. and for the person's Their welfare, well -being. A, yeah. a feeling. It's not a feeling of, I would love that person to be happier than they are mm -hmm. in most cases, mm -hmm. right? Sometimes it is, but it's rare. 
So what I'm encouraging here is that we love our enemies. In other words, the people who set themselves up as our enemies, we just need to love them the same way as we would love our friends, yeah. right? And if we did that, we'd be forgiving of them the same way and, and so forth, right? Yeah. So, so many of us tolerate in our friends, what mm -hmm. we, who we call our friends, some quite destructive behaviour yes. that shouldn't be tolerated at all. Yeah. And then in our enemies, we tolerate hardly anything yeah. at all. Yes. <laughs> tiny minor thing they might do and we're off you know yeah. so neither of those things is is particularly loving though is it correct yeah yeah to 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 truly love our love needs to be equally displayed mm -hmm. and that means that every person is deserving of your love it doesn't mean you're going to love them because mm -hmm. that depends upon your condition mm -hmm. uh, if you're at one with god you will love them right yeah. but but before then you probably love some and don't like others right yeah. or and in some cases you might be more accurate to say you love some or you just like some and you hate others yeah. you know that's probably the extent of our emotional state in in most cases and and what we need to do is change that we need to you know obviously change that now must we or or need we mm. Well, we need to change it. If we're ever going to be happy and, and the whole world is going to be happy, we need to change it. Do we have to change it? Well, no. If we had to, God would make a whole separate different law, set of laws that say you have to. <laughs> Instead, God's saying, no, if you do, there's benefits. And if you don't, there's not. You yeah. know, there's going to be hurts. Yeah. And, and so we're not forced into making mm -hmm. these adjustments or changes. Mm -hmm. We're not forced into loving our enemies. Mm -hmm. But we are, if you think about it, if we're going to be happy, required to love our enemies. Yes. If we're, if we're going to be happy, part of happiness is loving your enemies. Yes. <laughs> well, and what do you think about this idea that because God really requires of us eventually to enter a state of forgiveness, that that state of forgiveness is the way that we love our enemies? So um, it, it's to engage with forgiveness must come as a free will based decision on our part. But through that process, that's the only way we come to love our enemies, for want of a better word, isn't it? That's through, right. Through forgiveness. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So there's another quote from Luke uh, chapter four, 6, verses 27 onwards. And, and this one says, But I tell you who hear me, love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. So here uh, it was more specific about who your enemies are. It's, the, it's, not, it's not who you believe your enemies are, but rather it's the people who have set themselves up as your enemy in themselves. They hate you. They, they want to hurt you. They want to do things to you, to harm yeah. you. I said, bless those who curse you. Pray for those who will treat you. If someone strikes you on one cheek, t turn to him the other also. If someone takes your cloak, do not stop him from taking your tunic. <laughs> Now here, I see the average person back then would respond violently to every one of those situations. Mm -hmm. You know, if someone hit them, they'd hit them back. If someone stole something from them, they'd, they'd not only steal from them back, but under the law, they could take seven times back. Mm -hmm. So, so they, you know, punishment was like a, like a major thing back then in terms yeah. of the only way to handle crime was mm -hmm. to, com to have a complete uh, way of punishment. And, and some of the crimes like dishonoring your mother or your father mm. was a crime liable to the death penalty. Yeah. So, you know, I was talking to an audience where just dishonoring your dad mm -hmm. was enough for your dad to be able to murder you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right? and, yeah. and so, you know, obviously a very harsh society mm -hmm. and, and my, the contrast was quite great with staying, saying these words. Obviously, everyone was quite shocked yep. because, it, because in comparison to what the law, the Torah, had, had suggested to them, it was completely different. Mm -hmm. So, so do we have to love our enemies? Well, well, if we are going to be happy, you are at some point going to have to love your enemies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but God doesn't. God's laws don't demand yeah. that you love your enemies. Only through that very eventual process, sometime in our future, when the laws of compensation grind down of us on us so much that we um, ultimately choose to engage forgiveness is that or is that a an unfair representation well you can't say that the law demands anything of you the law is just a it's just a thing that operates yes it's just penalties for this and rewards for that that's yep. how every law it's like the law of gravity it doesn't demand anything of mm -hmm. you 
although I suppose you could say it sort of does in in, in a in a in a roundabout way. <laughs> Because, well, it, because it demands that you don't, you know, jump off a high building, but, but you can still do it. <laughs> you just die when you hit the ground, yeah. that's all. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. you can still do things. Yes. You, you just die by breaking the law. Yeah. You know, that, that's how it is. And the same operates with your soul. Yes. So you can still be unloving. Yeah. But, so you can choose to be unloving. Everybody, yeah. a lot of people on the world choose to be, as we talk, addictions are unloving. So most people choose that every day every hour every second sometimes you know <laughs> so so most of us choose to be unloving very very regularly you're allowed yeah. to choose to be unloving yeah. right the reality is the law will operate yeah. as it will has been designed to operate yeah. to try and correct the unloving action but you're still allowed to choose it mm -hmm. right it doesn't uh, force you but it does in some ways in a roundabout way require you to if you're going to exercise love completely at some point you're going to get to the stage where you love your enemies mm -hmm. but remember love itself is a desire so arriving there can't be done through your intellectual process or some decision making process that you've made intellectually to become a loving person it's not going to work like that mm -hmm. it has to be a feeling mm -hmm. that you have to love somebody mm -hmm. before you will love them yeah. and so I am re you could say I am required eventually to have a feeling that I love my enemies. Yeah. Not that I'm required eventually to love my enemies, yeah. but that I'm required to have a feeling of love for my enemies, which actually will ex uh, demonstrate itself by action. Yeah. Hmm. Mm. Okay. And I, I feel that um, a lot of the things that are misinterpreted uh, from what we say are because people think that they can choose to intellectually do things without avo and avoid the emotional side of themselves. Yeah. And that's not the way God's laws work. I think we've made that clear through the Repentance and Forgiveness series, yeah. that the law works upon the emotional condition, not, not the intellect. Yeah. And so you can think you want to love, but while emotions are in you saying that are not loving, mm -hmm. are there, you're not going to love. Mm -hmm. You have to get rid of those emotions in order to love. Yeah. And so to come to love your enemies, you're going to have to get rid of those emotions. Mm -hmm. yep. Now, the law requires you to feel love for your enemies, mm -hmm. not to act lovingly to your enemies without feeling it. Yeah. Yeah. And also that law is not demanding. It's not forcing that. Uh, it's not. It can't override our free will choices. Well, well let, let's look at it more clearly yeah. uh, because it's this second part to this answer. Yeah. And that is love itself has to be understood. Yes. And to understand it, you need to be able to feel it mm -hmm. as God feels it. Mm -hmm. Now, this is where the majority of people on earth have a huge problem because the definitions of love on earth are very much surrounding meet my addictions, I'll meet yours. That's love. That's love. Yeah. And, and that is not love. And so we've got to also ask ourselves, am I required to love my enemies God's way or human way? Yeah. Now, we're obviously the law is not going to require us to love God's enemies in the human way. Love our enemies in the human way. Yeah, yeah because the human way at the moment is flawed. Yeah. The law will require us to love our enemies the way God loves our yes. enemies. Yeah. In God's way. That's what the law is going to require of us. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need to come to terms with. What is God's way? <laughs> yeah. And God, you can see, like I said to the, in the first century, God has made it, the sunshine upon the wicked and the righteous. He, he loves us enough to treat us equally, at least. <laughs> and if we don't treat other people equally, there's a demonstration we're not loving as God does. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a good example of how we can come to love as God does by loving you know our son or daughter physical son or daughter the same way as we love somebody who hates us mm -hmm. in the same equal manner you know would you give your the person who hates you what you've given your son or daughter that's a good question mm -hmm. that a lot of us need to ask ourselves would we would desire to do that you know because that that would be a demonstration of the equality of our love mm -hmm. yeah not that you would do it, depending upon the condition of the individual, how they might receive the gift. Mm -hmm. But do you desire to do it? Right? If, if their condition was the same, would you do it? Mm -hmm. right, that's the real question. 
And what I see most of the time is the answer to that question is no. The average person won't do it. The average person often will give their children who are in a worse condition than many people around them more than they'll give somebody who's in a better condition something. Mm. And that, that's a demonstration that they're not loving the way God loves. Yeah. What does it mean to love my enemies? Well, again, we need to examine our feelings here. What, what are our feelings going to be if we truly love our enemies? Mm -hmm. Now, let's look firstly at this issue of forgiveness and repentance, because that's the issue, the subject that we're really focusing our attention on. If I loved my enemy, if my enemy did something to harm me on purpose, would I forgive him if I loved him? Well, I would, wouldn't I? Mm -hmm. I would forgive him. It, it would be without reserve and without resistance and without delay. time, delay, yeah, yeah. without delay. I would love him. Mm -hmm. If I don't, then am I really loving him? Definitely not, mm -mm. right? So, so you can see here just on the aspect of forgiveness and repentance, if I love my enemies, I would forgive and I would also engage repentance as well for mm -hmm. those who I harm. Yeah. And I would, I would love them by doing that. That's an action I can take that demonstrates my love for them. Yeah. 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 And I would also do things like seeking the truth about how I have been harmed by mm -hmm. somebody's sin. Mm -hmm. In other words, I, I, would, I would want to shine the spotlight on the sin. Mm -hmm. See, what I notice most people to do to, who, today who have friends, mm -hmm. what they do is they each avoid each other's sins. They, they, they do not highlight the sins of their friends, right? They only highlight the sins of their enemies. <laughs> and even then they don't know if it's a sin or not from mm -hmm. God's perspective. It's only a sin if it was a sin to me, mm -hmm. right? And, and so a person who truly loves his enemies and also loves his friends, actually, would, would actually find out what God feels about the sin and then highlight the sin, no matter whether it was a friend or an enemy who committed the sin. That's what he would do. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. that's a bit, bit different than what <laughs> the average person on planet does. <laughs> yeah. I will uphold the truth with any person who's harmed me. And in fact, I would uphold the truth with any person, period, mm -hmm. right? Again, I would see the truth from God's perspective. I've got this connection with the conscious. I'm able to see the truth from God's perspective. And I would uphold the truth with my friends. So even if my friends might turn into my enemies because I do this, I would still do it. Yep. And I would also do it with the people who have treated me like their enemy. I'll say, no, what you're doing is wrong. Mm -hmm. I will also do that, mm -hmm. right? I'll also uphold the truth when they do the right thing. Yes. I will say, wow, you did a great thing there, yeah. even though you're treating me badly. Yeah. There, in that situation, you did good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I would do. Yeah. <laughs> you don't see that happening very no. often. Right? <laughs> Everyone is looking often for an opportunity to pull uh, uh, their enemies down. Yeah. And they don't look for opportunities to praise them. Yeah. Right? Because yeah. they're an enemy. Why would you do one to do that? <laughs> is the average way people think, right? Yeah. But if you love your enemies, this is what you'd do. You'd do the same as you would with your friends. If, you, if you've got a good friend and you, were, you personally were a good friend, what you would do is whenever they, did, they took a wrong step that was out of harmony with God's law, you'd say, mate, it's out of harmony with God's law. Yeah. You know, you, you shouldn't be doing that. So why aren't you doing that with your enemy? You'd do that with your enemy too. But, but, if your friend does something that's in harmony, goes, that's a fantastic thing you did. Well, it's so wonderful to see their result. And why wouldn't you do the same with your enemy? Of mm -hmm. course you would. Mm -hmm. If you loved him, mm -hmm. you would. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you would uphold love of yourself when you're with them. Yes. As well. So in other words, whenever your enemy tried to pull down your love of self, yeah, no, I don't deserve that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, you would not agree to be subservient mm -hmm. to the people who want power and control over you. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't do that. Yeah. So these are just some ways that yeah. you would start, you would love your enemies in a practical sense. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and there's obviously many more thousands <laughs> of ways, but it just gives people a bit of an illustration of what you would do if your love was the same as God's love. Yeah. Uh, you, this is what you would do. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Lovely. All right, everyone. Well, we're going to take a break in our discussion now. We'll come back to it on another day. So that really concludes session one of our discussion in response to Sandra's uh, uh, letter to us. Hopefully you have uh, gained some good knowledge from this practical example. We're trying to make this quite a practical discussion. 
Mm. Uh, as a reminder, uh, we talked a lot at the beginning of our talk about how spirit influence happens um, and why we might be open to spirit influence because that was something that Sandra brought up in her letter. Uh, we also talked about how to tell when harm is being done to us from God's perspective. And then we've just been talking about the effects of refusing to forgive and contrasting that just now in our discussion with the effects of desiring what happens when I actually want to forgive. Mm. So hopefully uh, we're, we're making it pretty apparent <laughs> <laughs> the, the um, benefits of wanting to forgive and the pitfalls of not wanting to. Yes, yeah, so I think we've made some headway into mm -hmm. the in responding to the email from Sandra, but yeah. there's still, as you know, a lot of material to cover. Yes. There's another probably three or four hours we're going to do yeah. on, on answering her questions. And the reason why is that, is the questions imply a lot of things that yes. we need to actually address. Yeah. So, you know, obviously we need to have another opportunity or another bite at this particular <laughs> subject. Um, so there'll be a session two on this particular subject when yeah. we get the chance to do that, which will probably be in a few weeks time. Yeah. yeah. And we wanted to uh, kind of acknowledge Sandra, didn't we, in that she's someone who often says things that a lot of people feel and who aren't brave enough to say it or want to maintain a facade about how they really feel. Mm. And I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, we want yeah. to say to Sandra, we really love how you want to you speak up because <laughs> a lot of people just sit there and we notice this a lot in our audiences where people just sit there and they're really feeling disagreement, you know, with what's being said mm -hmm. to them. But they're not voicing their disagreement yeah. in a way that's questioning. You know, yeah. they, they're either in a place of emotional resistance where they're just angry about mm -hmm. their disagreement or they are trying to ignore the fact they disagree at all yeah. and just trying to stay engaged. Yeah. And both of those things are not conducive to a proper discussion. Yeah. We need, if you feel disagreement, you need to say something in disagreement, mm -hmm. but voice it in a way that questions what, where you disagree, stating why you disagree and so forth. Mm -hmm. And I feel Sandra has done well at that. Yeah. She, she, she's, whenever she has some disagreement or she doesn't understand, she says she doesn't understand yeah. and she says that she doesn't agree with that and she says that she feels differently to that and and this enables a, a good discussion and you mm -hmm. can see the last four hours of our discussion have really been enabled by Sandra's desire yeah. to actually speak up and say no I, I think something's wrong here you know? yeah, I don't yeah. know what, what, can I have more information about this <laughs> And, and that is a good thing. It is a good thing. We should say to Sandra, though, she's sent many hundreds of emails in a very similar vein to us, not actually listening to the responses that have been given. And that's a so, bad thing. <laughs> so it, that's the step that still needs to be taken. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But... You know, that doesn't they're... negate our praise of, of and, and, this uh, And I think what we've quality. covered in the last four hours or so is going to help Sandra too, because we've said quite clearly why she doesn't hear the response. Yes. And yes. it's all to do with not getting rid of certain emotions, which causes us to be completely blocked to responses. Yeah. And I think if Sandra reflects upon that personally, she'll realise why she is not responding and why she doesn't understand and why yeah. she keeps sending in the same questions. Yeah. So, and, and if you think about, many of us have maybe watched the videos, you know, many of you in the audience have probably watched videos over many years and you notice the same people asking the same questions over and over again, just a different way, but it's basically the same question, right? The reason why that's happening is because there's no emotional processing yeah. related to that subject that the person is actually making progress on. It, and it, it reminds me when I get in that state, it's like there's a scratch in the record and I just keep going. Yeah. Boop, 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 boop. And it just yeah. repeats, repeats, <laughs> repeats, 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 repeats. And this is what we're like. Yeah. We waste time and energy uh, and thought processes uh, because we are not working through our emotional condition. So the key thing with every one of these discussions is Everything to do with love is emotional. Mm -hmm. We must work through our emotional condition if we want some, to see some improvement. And also, if we want to understand things better, we must work through our emotional condition. The only way you're going to understand the answers better is by working through <laughs> the emotional condition. That's the way you do it. So that's what we need to learn to do. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Dylan, for your time. And thank you also for sharing in this discussion uh, a little bit about yourself and mm. your example. Yeah, my pleasure. <laughs>